Hi guys, so today we are going to talk about chapter 7, which is the skeletal system. It's a really long chapter because they threw everything together into one chapter, so I've divided it into three lectures. So first we're going to talk about the bone tissue and associated tissues with it. Then we're going to talk about the axial skeleton, and finally we'll talk about the appendicular skeleton. So first off, bones of course are the organs of the skeletal system, but they're made up of a lot of different tissues, and that's what most people don't think about. So it's not just bone tissue, but there's also cartilage on the ends of the bones. There's dense connective tissue that's necessary, and then blood and nervous tissue, of course. So bones are actually alive. They have a lot of different functions. They support and protect the softer tissues. So like our rib cage, for example, surrounds our lungs and our heart to protect it. They also provide points of attachment for muscles so that we can move around. Our muscles will pull against our bones in order to get us to move where we want to go. They house the blood producing cells and also store some inorganic salts. So bones vary greatly in size and shape, but they do have some things in common. Their structure is common, how they develop is also common, and their functions, of course. So bones can be classified by shape. Long bones are, as the name implies, long. They have very expanded ends, but they're narrow in the middle. Short bones, as the name implies, are short. They're kind of cube-like, and their length and width are about the same. These include the round bones known as the sesamoid bones, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and they're embedded in tendons. Flat bones, again, as the name implies, are flat. They are plate-like and have very broad surfaces. And then irregular bones, again, as the name implies, are irregularly shaped. They have a variety of different shapes, and most are connected to several other bones. So the zygomatic bone and the vertebrae are examples of that. So a long bone can be broken down into its individual parts. The epiphysis is the expanded end, and there's two of them, of course, the distal and the proximal. The diaphysis is that long center, that shaft. The metaphysis is the part between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. So basically where the shaft starts to widen out, that's going to be the metaphysis. On the ends of the epiphyses is articular cartilage. That is hyaline cartilage, which is the weakest of the cartilages, remember, but it helps protect the ends of the long bones. The periosteum is the membrane that covers the bone, and it's made of dense connective tissue. The compact bone is the wall of the diaphysis, and spongy bone is also known as cancellous bone, and it kind of looks like a sponge, which is why we call it spongy bone. And that makes up the epiphyses. The trabeculae are branching bony plates that are actually inside the spongy bone, and they make it up, basically. Then we have the medullary cavity, which is the hollow chamber in the diaphysis. So it's the hollow chamber going all the way down the shaft. This contains our bone marrow. The endosteum is the membrane that lines the cavity. And then bone marrow, of course, is red or yellow. And that lines the medullary cavity and spongy bone spaces as well. Mature bone sites are called osteocytes. So we're going to have a few cells involved here. So you need to know which type is which. So bone cells that have completely matured and now just function in maintenance, basically, are osteocytes. Osteocytes occupy chambers called lacunae, so cartilage cells have lacunae, so do bone cells. They exchange nutrients and waste through little processes with passageways called canaliculi. And I love saying that word, canaliculi, so don't forget it. They also have an extracellular matrix of bone that's made of collagen fibers and some inorganic salts. Remember, I've told you, anytime you hear collagen, think strength. So the collagen fibers are what give bones their resilience, and the inorganic salts make it hard. Compact bone versus spongy bone. Compact bone are made of osteons, so they're cylindrical units. 
So under the microscope, they kind of remind me of a tree with the rings going around it. Very strong and solid, and these are going to be in areas that need to bear weight. They resist compression, so they don't break as easily. Spongy bone, on the other hand, kind of looks like a sponge, and as I said earlier, it consists of branching trabeculi. It's somewhat flexible and has spaces between the trabeculi to actually make it lighter. So as I said, compact bone consists of the osteons, and the osteocytes are inside of the lacunae. There are things called lamellae, which are layers of matrix that surround the central canal. And that central canal is what's going to have the blood vessels and the nerves. Osteons are cemented together by bone matrix. So just like the picture shows you, the osteons are right next to each other. There's something called perforating canals that actually join adjacent canals. So in the picture there, you can see how the blood vessels and the nerve run through the bone. So they're going up the central canal and then across through perforating canals. So think about it like if something perforates something, it's kind of going through it, right? So perforating canals perforate that bone. They go through the sides of the bone. So the central canals are up and down. The perforating canals are through the side. Blood vessels provide the nutrients to the bone tissue and osteocytes can pass these nutrients to each other through the canaliculi. And the osteocytes are basically the cells that help maintain the bone. Parts of the skeletal system actually begin to develop during the first few weeks of prenatal development. Bony structures are going to continue to grow and develop until adulthood, and we're going to talk about how you can tell if growth has stopped later on. So bones form when bone tissue replaces existing connective tissue in one of two ways either through intramembranous bones or endochondral bones. So it's called intramembranous ossification or endochondral ossification. So during the first few weeks of prenatal development, as I said, these bones can actually start to develop. So in a 14-week-old fetus, you can see the picture on the side there. The bones are actually starting to form. So intramembranous ossification is going to form the flat skull bones, clavicles, sternum, and some of the facial bones. Endochondral ossification forms the long bones and most of the skeleton because the skeleton kind of starts out as a hyaline cartilage model. And then that cartilage is going to be replaced by bone. And you can kind of tell that with the name, endochondral ossification. Ossification means it's turning to bone. And chondral, anytime you hear chondral, you should think of cartilage. So chondrocytes are the cartilage cells. So endochondral ossification kind of tells you that bone is replacing cartilage. So the intramembranous bones originate within sheet-like layers of connective tissue. So again, these are going to be the broad flat bones. So flat bones of the skull, the clavicle, the sternum, and then some of the facial bones are also formed this way. Intramembranous ossification is replacing the embryonic connective tissue to form that intramembranous bone. So the cartilage is replaced by bone. Mesenchymal cells in the primitive tissue differentiate into osteoblasts. Now osteoblasts are another type of cell you have to know. Osteoblasts are the bone forming cells that deposit the bone matrix around themselves. There's another cell we're going to talk about called osteoclasts, and osteoclasts actually break down bone. So if you remember blasts build and clasts carve, maybe that will help. So blasts build bone and clasts carve bone, so they break it down. So anyway, osteoblasts are the bone forming cells. So when they are completely surrounded by matrix, they mature into osteocytes inside of the lacunae. So osteocytes are basically osteoblasts that have completed their cycle and have matured. Mesenchyme on the outside is going to then form the periosteum, so that outer membrane. So here's a picture just showing you how the ossification center starts. The osteoblasts are going to lay the bone, and after they finish laying bone all around them, they turn into osteocytes, or they mature into osteocytes. 
blood vessels will start to innervate by weaving through the trabeculae of the spongy bone. And then compact bone ends up on the outside of the spongy bone. So endochondral bones begin as masses of hyaline cartilage. Most of the bones of the skeleton are actually formed this way. So the humerus, radius, phalanges, just to name a few. The whole process is basically replacing the hyaline cartilage model skeleton that we have as a fetus to form endochondral bone. The chondrocytes, which remember are the cartilage cells, are going to enlarge and the lacunae actually start to grow. The matrix breaks down and the chondrocytes die. Osteoblasts then invade the area and deposit bone matrix. They will form spongy bone and then compact bone. So once they're encased by this matrix, the osteoblasts mature into osteocytes. So here's a picture showing you that cartilaginous model. So we start out as hyaline cartilage. Primary and secondary ossification centers develop. The hyaline cartilage is replaced by bone. First, spongy bone on the inside and then compact bone on the outside. Osteoblasts are going to deposit the bone. The epiphyseal plates are the areas between the epiphyses and the diaphysis. And these are areas of growth, active growth. So when we are growing as a child, cartilage is being replaced by bone at the epiphyseal plate this entire time. So that's how we actually grow. Once we are done growing, once we mature into an adult, that epiphyseal plate disappears and turns into an epiphyseal line. So doctors can actually take an x-ray of a child's legs and look at the epiphyseal plate to see if it's stopped and is now an epiphyseal line because then they can say that the child has stopped growing. Kind of interesting. So make sure you know the epiphyseal plates and also osteoblasts are the bone building cells. Osteoclasts are the bone breaking down cells. This is just a chart showing you the major steps in bone development. So both intramembranous ossification and endochondral ossification. So make sure that you go through it and are familiar with the steps. So as I said, in the long bone, the diaphysis is separated from the epiphysis by an epiphyseal plate. This is the area that the bone grows in length. Cartilaginous cells actually form four different layers. We have the zone of resting cartilage, which is the layer closest to the end of the epiphysis. The resting cells kind of anchor that epiphyseal plate to the epiphysis. Then next you have the zone of proliferating cartilage. These are young cells that actually are still undergoing mitosis. Then you have the zone of hypertrophic cartilage. These are older cells that are kind of left behind as the new cells appear. The epiphyseal plate starts to thicken and the bone is starting to get longer. The matrix calcifies and the chondrocytes die. Finally, you have the zone of calcified cartilage, which is basically a thin layer of dead cartilage cells and calcified matrix. So as I said, once a child stops growing, that epiphyseal plate basically hardens into an epiphyseal line. And a doctor can see it on the x-ray and say, the child is full grown. This is just showing you the different zones that I just talked about. So again, osteoclast break down calcified matrix osteoblasts are going to then invade and replace the cartilage with bone. So bone can continue to grow in length as long as those cartilage cells of the epiphyseal plate remain active. Once the ossification centers meet, the epiphyseal plate will ossify and the bone can't grow anymore. And as I said, it turns into an epiphyseal line. The bone can thicken by depositing compact bone on the outside under the periosteum though. And we're always going to have a constant cycle of osteoblast putting bone down and then osteoclast coming behind it and breaking down that matrix. Osteoblast will then replace it. Osteoclast will break it down. So our skeleton is replaced about every seven years. So here's a chart showing you an ossification timetable. So what age something is happening and then what is actually happening. So as you can see, by 23 years in females and 25 in males, all of the bones are nearly ossified. So we're still growing past the age of 18, that's an adult age, 
we're still technically growing, just probably not in the way that you would think of growing. Our bones of the sternum, the clavicles, the vertebrae, our hips, those are still growing. Even some of the lower limbs might still be growing all the way up to 21 years in females and 23 years in males. So it's not the technical 18 and you stop growing idea. So as I said, bone remodeling occurs throughout life. So we're going to constantly be having deposition and reabsorption of the surfaces of the endosteum and periosteum. So bone resorption is the removal of bone, and this happens through the osteoclast activity. Bone deposition is the formation of bone, and this happens through the osteoblast activity. So as I said, 10 to 20% of the skeleton is replaced every year. So five to seven years, we have a whole new skeleton. Some things do affect bone development, growth, and repair, though. Nutrition, sunlight exposure, hormones, physical exercise are all going to affect it. Vitamin D is required for calcium absorption. If you have a deficiency, it causes rickets in children, osteomalacia in adults. Now, vitamin D, our skin, as we know, makes an inactive form of vitamin D. You got to get out in the sunlight to get your skin making that inactive form. Once it is made, it goes to the liver to become activated, and then you can absorb calcium. One thing you'll probably notice if you ever have to take a calcium supplement is that it'll have vitamin D along with it because you're probably deficient in vitamin D as well. So you make sure you have that vitamin D so that you can actually absorb the calcium. Vitamin A is another thing. It's going to impact osteoblast and osteoclast activity. If you have a deficiency, it actually slows down your bone development. Vitamin C is important for collagen synthesis. Collagen is one of the major parts of bone. It's what gives it its strength and resiliency. So if you have a deficiency, it actually results in slender, fragile bones that can break pretty easily. Growth hormone stimulates cartilage cell division. An insufficiency in a child can result in pituitary dwarfism. An excess causes gigantism in children and acromegaly in adults. Thyroid hormone causes replacement of cartilage with bone in the epiphyseal plate. So it's going to impact osteoblast activity. Parathyroid hormone stimulates osteoclasts to break down bone. Sex hormones like estrogen and testosterone promote bone formation and stimulate the ossification of the epiphyseal plate. And all of those hormones you're going to learn about in the second semester of anatomy when we talk about the endocrine system. Physical stress actually stimulates bone growth. So if you're working out, that's when your muscles and your bones can actually start growing. Clinically speaking, fractures are breaks in your bones. There are different types and they're classified by the cause and nature of the break. So a simple closed fracture is a fracture that is protected by uninjured skin. So you fractured the bone, but it's not breaking through the skin or anything. A compound open fracture is a fracture which the bone is exposed to the outside through an opening in the skin or a mucous membrane. So if you break your arm and it comes popping out your skin, that'd be a compound open fracture. So here are some other types of fractures. A green stick fracture is incomplete. So it's like you bend the bone and it only breaks on one side. This commonly happens to children with their collarbones. Happened to my son, he fell off a slide and got a green stick fracture on his collarbone, which just meant that one side broke, the other side did not. A fissured fracture is an incomplete break that runs longitudinally. A comminuted fracture is complete and fragments into bones. So the bone just shatters, basically. Those are really hard to repair. A transverse fracture goes transversely across the bone. An oblique fracture is just like an oblique cut. And a spiral fracture is caused by when you twist the bone excessively. So how do fractures repair themselves? First off, a large blood clot has to form. This is called a hematoma. It has to stop the bleeding, basically, because remember, there's blood vessels all through our bones. So if you break a bone, you're breaking blood vessels. Then it's replaced by a cartilaginous callus. 
Basically, phagocytes come in and remove debris, and the fibrocartilage invades it. That's replaced then by a bony callus. The osteoblasts are going to come in and invade and form a hard callus to fill the space. The last step is remodeling. The bone is going to be restored as close to the original shape as possible. So osteoclasts will come in and kind of remodel it and break down any excess bone, but your bone is never going to look exactly the same again. Your doctors will always be able to tell if you broke a bone. So the major functions of the bones we kind of talked about a little bit. They provide shape to the body, support and protect our structures, help body movements by providing attachment for muscles. They have tissue that produces blood cells and store some inorganic salts. So as far as support protection and movement goes, the bones provide shape for our head, face, thorax, and limbs. They help support our body weight, especially the lower limbs and the pelvis and our vertebral column. The skull bones protect the brain, the eyes, and the ears. And of course, the brain is very important to protect. The rib cage, as I said earlier, protect the heart and the lungs. The pelvic girdle protects our internal reproductive organs and the lower abdominal organs. And again, the bones provide a point of attachment for our muscles so that we can move. Hematopoiesis is blood cell formation. So blood cell production occurs in the red bone marrow. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are all produced there. With age, some red bone marrow is going to be replaced by yellow bone marrow, which actually stores fat and does not produce blood cells. So that's easy enough to remember. Red bone marrow produces blood cells. Blood is red, red bone marrow. Yellow bone marrow stores fat. Fat is yellow, hence yellow bone marrow. About 70% of the bone matrix consists of the inorganic mineral salts. Most abundant salt is crystals of hydroxyapatite, calcium phosphate. Other salts are going to have magnesium, sodium, potassium, and carbonate ions. Osteoporosis is a condition that results from a loss of this mineralization. Calcium is vital in nerve impulse conduction and muscle contraction. So our blood calcium is going to constantly be regulated by two hormones called parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, and they oppose each other. So one's going to raise our blood calcium, one's going to lower our blood calcium. But think about it. To do that, we have to get the calcium stores from the bone. So if our blood calcium is too high, we're going to take calcium out and deposit it into our bone matrix. But if our blood calcium is low, we need osteoclasts to break it down to raise our blood calcium. Because calcium is so important in those other functions, we need to make sure there's enough blood calcium. So here's a picture of hormonal control of blood calcium. So if our blood calcium gets too high, receptors in the thyroid gland are going to sense this and send that information to the control center. The thyroid will then release calcitonin. Calcitonin will stimulate osteoblast activity and calcium will be deposited into the bone. Since you're depositing it into the bone, it's being removed from the blood. So your blood calcium will go down and return back to normal. On the other hand, if your blood calcium gets too low, receptor cells in the parathyroid gland pick this up. They send it to the control center and the parathyroid glands are going to release parathyroid hormone which is the antagonist to calcium. It will stimulate osteoclast activity. They will break down the bone and release it into the blood. Therefore, your blood calcium will go back up. So how do we prevent fragility fractures? Well, a fragility fracture is a fracture that occurs after you fall from less than standing height. And this is basically a sign of low bone density. Females are more prone to this than males. But as I said, bone remodeling occurs throughout life. But as we get older, osteoclast activity tends to outpace osteoblast activity. So osteoclasts are removing bone faster than osteoblasts can deposit it. This can result in osteopenia, which is bone loss, or progress all the way to osteoporosis, which is severe bone loss, where you actually start losing your bone and spaces are there and it weakens them. 
Half of the people over 50 have one of these bone loss conditions. It's very common in postmenopausal women because of the hormonal changes. And we will actually talk more about this when we get to hormones. So in order to prevent fragility fractures, make sure you get about 30 minutes of exercise a day, including weight-bearing exercise. Weight-bearing exercise is going to help strengthen your bones and stop this from happening. Get enough calcium and vitamin D, of course, and do not smoke. So if you're a woman, you have to worry about this a lot more than if you're a man. Those spaces that are inside the bones really make them weak. So you can just fall and break a hip, and that's not a good thing. So make sure you exercise, get your calcium and vitamin D, and don't smoke. That's it for now. We will talk again after the next lecture, which will be the axial skeleton. Bye.